Thank you for joining us for this seminar in which we examine Pakistan's extremely contentious and globally criticized blasphemy laws, who is organized today under the auspicious of the International Alliance for the Defense of Rights and Liberties, Alliance Internationale pour la Défense des Droits et des Libertés Ideal. The following are some of the topics that will be discussed. First of all, the legal foundation for blasphemy legislation. The use of blasphemy legislation to legitimize ethnic cleansing and how females are particularly affected by this. These legal basis of the blasphemy laws uh, are started already related to the religion were first uh, codified by India's British rulers in 1860 and were expanded in 1927. Pakistan inherited these laws when it came into existence after the partition of India in 1947. Between 1980 and 1986, a number of clauses were added to the laws by the military government of General Zia ul Haq, who wanted to Islamicize them. In the process, what were fairly moderate laws became something else altogether. Various international human rights bodies and mechanisms have clarified that the mandatory imposition of the death penalty, which is prescribed under section 295C of the Pakistani law, which covers blasphemy, is prohibited under the international human rights law. Sections 295C clearly violates, violate, violates Pakistan's obligations under the international covenant on civil and political rights, which Pakistan voluntarily ratified on 23rd of June 2010, which includes an obligation to respect the rights of life, to a fair trial, and to prohibit torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. The International Commission of Jurists has said that the blasphemy laws should be repealed or amended to bring them in line with Pakistan's international legal obligations. And there is, that there is no credible reason for the responsible officials in Pakistan not to address as a matter of urgency the glaring legal and procedural issues that contribute to making criminal proceedings or on blasphemy charges in Pakistan fundamentally unfair. The ECG has further stated, however, that all the institutions of the Pakistani state, the executive, the parliament, and members of the judiciary have effectively abdicated their responsibilities under human rights law. More recently, and closer to home, a motion for a resolution tabled by the left group in the European Parliament in April of this year called on the European Union and its member states to strengthen their engagement in political discussions with Pakistan to demand the abolition of the death penalty and to fulfill its human rights <coughs> obligations. The motion also called into question Pakistanis eligibility to continue to benefit from the EU's generalized scheme of preferences, which removes imported duties, import duties from products coming into the European Union market from developing countries. The use of laws to justify <coughs> ethnic cleansing. By ethnic cleansing, we mean the systematic forced removal of ethnic, racial, and or religious groups from a given territory by a more powerful ethnic group, often with the intent of making it ethnically homogeneous. <coughs> Muhammad Bashir Khan, a member of parliament for Prime Minister Imran Khan's ruling party, has been widely quoted as saying, Pakistan is an ideological Islamic State, and we need religious education. I feel that even now our syllabus is not 
completely Islamized enough. And we need to do more Islamization to have more an ideological training of our citizens. In July 2020, the government of Pakistan announced the creation of a single national curriculum to replace in 2006 schools curriculum. Christian Solidarity Worldwide, who are joining us in our discussion today, has reported in an attempt to make the proposed curriculum more digestible to Pakistan's more conservative Islamist elements, <coughs> and particularly to win the support of the country's madrasas Islamic religious schools. Some water, please. Yeah. The government of Punjab granted the Islamic uh, Mati Hadi Ulema boards a role in the review and approval of all textbooks under the SNC. This has proved disastrous, providing the MUB with an opportunity to reinforce the sectarian and divisive agendas which have permeated the Pakistani education system for decades. The particular effects on females, a survey carried out by the Thomson Reuters Foundation, ranked Pakistan as the third most dangerous country in the world for women, after Afghanistan and the Democratic Republic of Congo. The majority of the victims of violence have no legal recourse whatsoever. Proposed legislation providing for stringent punishment against these perpetrators of domestic violence has seen opposition from religious hardliners. The advisor to the Prime Minister on Parliamentary Affairs, Babar Awam, who has objected to what he deems to be an Islamic provisions included in the bill called for a review of the domestic violence bill by the Council of Islamic Ideology. The Council has effectively halted this bill. Indian and feminist writer Urvaji Butali pointed out while the threat of death or excommunication hangs over all those who dare to question religion, men or women, for women, there is also the additional threat of sexual violence. And while they remain alive, sexual stigma and targeting. <coughs> Fariazis of the Karachi-based Women's Action Forum said, we've seen a weaponization of blasphemy increase. <coughs> there is a pattern since 2017 of using it against <coughs> dissidents while giving the oppression to protect Islam and the religious sensitivities of the Muslim majority in Pakistan, the country's blasphemy laws are vaguely formulated and arbitrarily enforced by the police and the judiciary. As a result, they permit, if not encourage, abuse, harassment and persecution of minorities in Pakistan. Are blasphemy laws compliant with human rights? Who say yes? Who says no? In my opinion, it depends on what kind of blasphemy laws we are talking about, or what kind of human rights we are talking about, as well as the question where is also important. Countries as Nigeria, Iran, Afghanistan, Somalia, Mauritania, Saudi Arabia, and of course, Pakistan still have the death penalty for insulting the religion or their big profits. I, Andy Vermout of the International Alliance for Rights and Freedom, was in that context inspired by the researcher Marie Jules Peterson, but also by Manirm Salmi and Willy Fautre and Gary Cartwright. I also want to emphasize that Islam as a religion includes also a multitude of different perspectives, perceptions, and human rights roles represented in various historical, socio-economic, cultural, and political ways by different actors. And this conference is not an attack on Islam, but on how states use Islamic blasphemy laws 
to undermine the human rights of their citizens or their minorities. Most human and civil rights activists are highly critical of, blas of blasphemy laws. And for that matter, religion in general. They say the two are incompatible because blasphemy laws are being used a lot to legitimize human rights violations. Think about the use of beating and other cruel penalties in some Islamic countries. Some countries will still some blasphemy laws or the numerous sexual characteristics and rule of some Muslim majority nations. Hello, my name is Andy Vermoot and I'm the moderator of this debate. First, I want to give the floor to Paul Casada, former member of the European Parliament and founder and executive director of the South Asia Democratic Forum. The floor is yours, Paulo. Thank you very much uh, for um, this uh, invitation and uh, congratulations for this initiative. This is a very important topic, a topic that the South Asia Democratic Forum has been dealing with for quite some time. Uh, and by the way, whoever wants to uh, deepen a bit the issue, you are very much welcome to go through our, our website. We have a very uh, big number of papers and uh, especially a policy brief uh, number seven on this specific issue that uh, really highlights everything that has been going around it. I would like to address it uh, through uh, three uh, main angles. Well, the first one is obviously the legal one that was already um, highlighted. It comes from uh, uh, the so-called colonial um, you know, legislation uh, it, from uh, uh, the, the 19th century. Um, but uh, uh, and it, it, it is argued several times that, uh, well, it is uh, really nothing novel, but it is not. Mm, there are a, a number of novel things uh, that were already highlighted, nam namely the section 295 C that uh, uh, imposes a mandatory death penalty for a very vague criminal offense of uh, um, insult to the prophet. But uh, um, there are some crucial numbers uh, that uh, will allow us to understand uh, what it really means. I mean, from 1851 to 1946, there are six cases uh, registered of uh, blasphemy. Uh, six legal cases registered. From the independence, from uh, Pakistan independence, from 47 to 1981, there are eight. From 1981 to 2012, there are 1,246. So this gives you uh, what uh, it really uh, is happening in legal terms. Because uh, other than the legal framework, the very vague legal framework, uh, the fact that uh, there was a refusal to uh, do whatever to, pun to, pu to punish those who accuse um, uh, without foundation someone of uh, blasphemy, uh, this would have been a very important step to, uh, to decrease the number of uh, uh, accusations, um, other than this legal framework, the most important thing is the pressure coming from the uh, fanatic uh, environment. Um, because especially in the last uh, 10 years, the most um, well-known case was the, the case of uh, Asia BB. One has to uh, take in consideration that the governor of uh, uh, Punjab that uh, opposed this um, uh, blasphemy condemnation of Asia Bibi, uh, um, he was um, uh, assassinated. Uh, and um, the minister of uh, religious minorities that defended AGBB IG as well, he was also assassinated. So both of them were assassinated. And worse than this, 
the assassin, uh, that by the way came uh, from a religious school that was supposed not to be the fanatic one, the Baraldi, uh, whereas um, the, the, fanat the fanatics were uh, supposed to be the Diobandis. Um, this religious uh, fanatic that was um, sentenced to death and was uh, executed, he was transformed into a hero. He has a shrine and his shrine is visited by uh, immense um, uh, quantities of people. So the issue is that other than the law, there is a fanaticization of the society that comes into the point that no one really dares to be a lawyer of defense of whoever is accused of blasphemy because the lawyers are under attack. And the judges, whoever uh, dares not to condemn someone that is accused of blasphemy is also uh, under attack. So the judges are also um, not uh, able to confront this, um, this system. And it, it came to a point where uh, the judicial system um, sometimes uh, mandates um, immediate arrests, um, even before trial, uh, for the defense of the accused. Because if he is out, he's going to be murdered. <laughs> as simple as that. So uh, this went well beyond the law. This is a uh, uh, fanaticization of the society by which if there is any uh, gossip, uh, if there is uh, anything, you know, in the case of AGBB, that was the most well known, uh, it was next to nothing. It was uh, actually, uh, it was the, the use of uh, the same cup for drinking water than uh, that a Muslim woman uh, had been used. And so this was the, the origin of uh, the whole of the affair. So this was enough, you know, no, uh, not to, um, uh, not to uh, uh, go for this obligation of uh, segregation of, uh, uh, of cups of water. Um, and uh, this uh, environment uh, that is absolutely absurd uh, especially after uh, the, the assassinations of uh, the governor of Punjab and of uh, a member of the government, uh, really uh, went to a further step. I mean, no political, um, no one uh, in the political establishment dares to challenge this framework, because if he does, um, the, the chances that he's going to be assassinated are very high. He's going to be assassinated uh, nearly for sure. So this is the most important issue. I mean, there is a framework that, of course, the, the educational system that uh, our moderator uh, very rightly spoke about, and uh, uh, the, the issue has been, we have been dealing with the issue for a very long time. The educational system, the syllabus that is promoting fanaticism is a very important case in point. Um, and uh, as the moderator, also said, uh, our policy regarding this syllabus and that's also regarding trade has been really to give incentives to uh, this fanaticization process because <clears throat> uh, the GSP plus is uh, given to countries that are supposed to be models of uh, uh, human rights legislation. So when Europe is saying, this is, you are a model of human rights. It is obviously saying this um, uh, blasphemy uh, laws, uh, this blasphemy, more than the blasphemy laws, this, the way that you uh, are um, using blasphemy laws is very good. It's uh, no problem. Uh, and so this message, uh, Europe uh, and the West in general, but the European Union has a lot of responsibilities on the ways that the things are, are going. And of course, for the education, the same thing. I mean, the, uh, both the United Kingdom as a, as a country, the United Kingdom uh, has been um, giving uh, enormous subventions to the educational, educational system of Pakistan and the European Union never raised the issue that we are fabricating 
fanatics by an educational system that is completely biased and it is going worse as we just just, just heard. But I think that the, the issue has gone even worse than this. Last September, September 2020, we saw a terrorist attack in Paris where a, a Pakistani citizen um, actually, uh, he was uh, ill-informed. He did not know that uh, um, the Charlie Hebdo had changed its headquarters, just went to the premises and he knifed people at random very, uh, very seriously. This was a terrorist attack. <clears throat> and this terrorist attack, um, on this terrorist attack, the prime minister did not at all make any condemnation. We uh, know from the press that the father of the terrorist said he is fantastic, he's a very courageous uh, person, he did what was supposed to be done. And the prime minister did not apologize, quite on the contrary. He accused France of allowing blasphemy. So he opened a third chapter on this issue of the blasphemy laws, which is the use of this uh, uh, legal framework to uh, state sponsor global terrorism because that's what it is nothing but this and of course you can say well it's not very serious because it was not very professional I mean he did not, he did not even know that Charlie Abdo had uh, moved its headquarters and this is correct I mean this is not a very professional for the time being a terrorist uh, framework if we compare it uh, with Iran, because we have to bear in mind that uh, who started this sort of global uh, blasphemy uh, laws uh, was Iran, was Ayatollah Khomeini, um, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, the famous uh, fatwa on uh, Salman Rushdie. Um, he was the one who started. And of course, uh, in Iran, they are much more professional. They have... Uh, uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards that promote uh, terrorist attacks in the world in a more professional way. But, and this is not yet the case in Pakistan, at least Pakistan as a state. But the, the, the issue is that whereas in Iran, uh, the popular support to this sort of policy is actually dwindling and people are not believing it at all on these sort of values, in Pakistan, the popular support is there. I mean, uh, there is a country that was fanaticized um, uh, to, to the roots, and it is continuing to be. I mean, the children are brainwashed with this sort of uh, violent ideology um, that is done on the name of Islam. And of course, this is an insult to Islam. I think this is a blasphemy to Islam to say this is Islam. Uh, this is my opinion on the issue. Uh, and this is continuing, and nothing is, has been done on the issue. And the European Union says, quite on the contrary, well, everything is going well. You, we just even give you the the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest stamp of good behavior in human rights terms. And, and uh, this is um, really what we cannot allow any longer. Uh, and this is why this conference is so much uh, timely. And I hope that someone starts to hear the truth and some consistent policy uh, is going to appear in the European Union, which it did not up to now. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. In a first position, some condemn the whole idea of human rights. They see human rights as a Western creation born out of a Western culture and founded on Western ideals of secularism and individualism, and as such unrelated to the Muslim world. The ideal of human rights is not a universal value common to all human beings, regardless of religious belief. The British Hizib Ut Tahir writes in one of his pamphlets. If we translate this, he is actually saying the equal rights principle is not a fundamental norm common to all equal beings, independent of religious ideology. So they justify the blasphemy laws. Instead, they, like other opponents of human rights, tend to speak about Islamic freedom, 
focused on the Quran, like Islamic culture. Islam has laid down such basic moral rights for mankind as a whole. We should know that the young Osama bin Laden, who was finally discovered in Pakistan, was influenced in his anti-Soviet period by Abul Ala Maududi, an influential figure in the mid 20th century. Islamist movement, according to Maududi, Islamic fundamental rights are the right to live, protection, equality, and justice. The 1990 Cairo Declaration on Human Rights and Islam by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation is a clear effort to articulate such Islamic rights. The declaration states that fundamental rights and basic liberty are an integral part of Islamic faith and that all the privileges and freedoms stipulated in this declaration are subject to Islamic Sharia. Today we see predominantly Islamic rights activists among Islamic supremacists, both violent and non-violent. Just a limited number of the world Muslims agree that replacing universal human rights with Islamic freedom is necessary or beneficial. But a lot of these people can be found on key positions in the Pakistani community. Now I want to give the floor to Jürgen Klute, former member of European Parliament, a Christian theologian. Thank you, Jürgen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me <clears throat> and to give me the possibility to make some recommendation on blasphemy. Uh, of course, I'm not an uh, Islamic uh, theologian, uh, but a Christian one. But I think uh, Christianity, Judaism and uh, Islam have, uh, in spite of a lot of differences, uh, something uh, in common. And one point they have in common is the belief that at the end of your days, at the end of uh, the times, uh, you have to you you, you will uh, you have to appear uh, in front of a divine uh, judgment. I know not everybody uh, is, is a believer. Not everybody uh, everybody everybody is uh, is religious. Uh, but I I think it is helpful sometimes uh, to to try to understand a little bit uh, the thought uh, of religious, to find some, some arguments uh, against this uh, blasphemic law from the point of religious or the theology. I think that's possible. And that uh, I, I want to explain a little bit. I think uh, blasphemy, uh, blasphemy is, yeah, is, is, is an issue that, relates only to the to the relation between a believer and his God. If you bashing your God or if you believe him, if you love him, uh, how you treat him, how you think about God, that's uh, from from my point of view, uh, only a question of the individual or the personal relation you feel between as a believer, uh, between you and God. And that's not a question of uh, the general society. That's, uh, that's a point where, where I want to, to go to. And that means when you, <clears throat> that, uh, that the, uh, the, uh, if, um, if, you, if you believe in that, that at the end of your day, your God will judge your life and will decide whether you will go to the paradise or to the hell, uh, then that's a place where have to be decided whether blasphemic has, has been done by you or not. And I think it is not a question of of normal law, of normal states law. A normal states law cannot decide and cannot judge your relation as, as a believer between you and your God. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's, that's really, really simple from, from my point of view. Uh, if, if you take it serious, uh, what in the Bible or in the Torah or in the uh, Quran is written, uh, then you can't not 
uh, say and make a decision instead of Allah, instead of, of Yahweh, instead of the Christian uh, God. But you have to, to leave the, 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 this, this decision uh, at least uh, to your God. That's, that's uh, from my point uh, of view, uh, very simple. And I think that's a, that's a position of, uh, of the modern uh, Christian theology in Europe. I know we, we have this issue of blasphemy uh, in, in the churches as well. But in general, I think in, uh, in the Christian uh, churches, uh, meanwhile, the majority is uh, convinced that uh, the question of uh, blasphemy uh, is not an issue to state law and couldn't be decided by uh, state judges. It's only a issue between you and uh, God, and it has to be decided uh, at the end of your time, at the end uh, of your days in front uh, of a divine judgment. That's, uh, that's very short and, and, and clear for me, uh, uh, from my point of view. And the further aspect is, if, how can you, how can you as a believer, how can you as a human being decide or estimate what a blasphemy is? How could you know whether your God will take that what you criticize as a blasphemy, as a blasphemy, you can't know him. You, you, are, not, uh, <laughs> you, you, you are not able uh, as a believer to feel or to know the thoughts uh, of God. You can know only what is written in the Bible, in the Quran and in the Torah, but you can't know what God is thinking about what a man, what a human being is doing. And therefore you can't know whether from the point of view of your God, it is a blasphemy what a, what a human uh, being is doing or not. And the other point, you have to leave this decision to your God. That's a, you, you can find a lot of, uh, of uh, texts uh, in, uh, in the Christian Bible. Uh, which supports this, this uh, position to say, uh, you, you, you don't know uh, what, what God is thinking about you. You have to leave it to God. God knows, uh, you, you only can see the face, but God can see your heart. Uh, God knows your feelings. Uh, and therefore you can't do this decision as a human being about uh, other people to say, is he a believer or is he not a believer? That is left only to your God. If you are a believer, you have to respect that. The other point is Christianity, Judaism and Islam believes that the God, Allah, Yahweh or uh, the, the Christian God is a graceful God. And therefore, you can't know if at the divine judgment, your God will say, okay, what you did is a blasphemy, was a blasphemy. That might be, but then even you don't know how he will judge it. Maybe he says, I'm a graceful uh, God and uh, I forgive it. And that's the same point as I uh, um, said before, you don't know. How, God, uh, how your God will, uh, will estimate, how, how he will uh, judge that what you have done. We, as Christians and Jews and, and uh, as, as uh, Muslim, uh, Muslims, we believe in a God who is graceful at least, and he will forgive people what they did as sins. And therefore, you are not allowed to take a decision to take a judgment about uh, what other people have done in relation between a believer and God. That's out of the, the, the opportunity from a point of, uh, from a the, uh, theological point of view. And therefore, from my point of view, we should include, independent on the question whether you believe in a religious or in, in, uh, in a God or not, we should try to argue on a theological level as well and explain people, you are not allowed 
to do a decision instead of the God you believe in. You have to leave it to God. And therefore, a, a law on blasphemy has, is, is not acceptable as a part of a, uh, of a state law, because a state is not a God. He is only an organization between human beings to organize how they want to live and how they uh, yeah, uh, work and, and, and live together. So I think that's really important. And I think that's often forgotten. We, we, we should try to attack or to argue against this uh, blasphemy law, not only on the position uh, of uh, human rights, you declared it already uh, because a lot of uh, people don't uh, accept uh, the human rights uh, because it comes from the West. But then it could be helpful to reflect what religious says on the relation between a believer and God. And then you can explain to people, and I think a lot of, of uh, Muslim people will, uh, will agree with this position as well, that you have to leave this decision whether what you said or did is a blasphemy and how it will be or should be judged by your God you believe in has to be left to your God. And that's all. And that's what I want to contribute to here. It's not so long, it's not so much, but I hope it can inspire you to, to reflect a little bit more the religious uh, thoughts, the system of religious thoughts and uh, theological thought as well. And uh, I, I know we, we have in Germany, I'm from Germany, uh, we, we have some young uh, Muslim uh, uh, theologians uh, at uh, a few German universities they are thinking in this uh, uh, direction as well. And we should encourage them. They are often attacked by, by, by the fanatic is, uh, Islamistic uh, people. But I, I, I want to, to underline that's not only a question of uh, Islamic religion. We have in Christianity a lot of uh, fanatic people as well. Uh, it's a problem of, of all religious uh, religions, uh, from my point of view. In the Jewish uh, uh, sector, you can find uh, some, some fan uh, fanatic people as well, or believer as well. Therefore, I think we should uh, connect and, and network with, with, uh, with this, uh, people. They are in line with, uh, with human rights, uh, with, with uh, theological uh, geology theologians uh, which are in line with, with uh, human rights and who are able to argue from the religious side, from the theological side as well in line with human rights. So that's what I wanted to um, contribute uh, this morning and I thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Jürgen Klute. Uh, I have also a second position is of the organization of Islamic cooperation. They never mentioned their declaration of Cairo, but that doesn't mean there isn't already a lot of doubt about at least certain civil rights. Former Secretary General of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Iyad Madani, said there are a variety of problems that go beyond the usual reach of human rights and conflicts with Islamic teaching. Critics like Madani claim that Islamic blasphemy laws and human rights are only limited in nature. Although, from a conserv conservative Islamic point of view, for example, the right to education and employment is opportune. Such gender rights are, according to many, beyond the usual reach of human rights, violating conventional family arrangements gender norms, and Islamic values. Now I give the floor to Willy Fautré, Director of Human Rights Without Frontiers. The floor is yours, Willy. Thank you, Andy. And thank you very much uh, for inviting me and uh, congratulations as well for the initiative that you have taken to raise this issue 
uh, about uh, concerning Pakistan, but also concerning the EU. And this is what I will try to, to highlight in my presentation. Uh, just first, a few words about Human Rights Without Frontiers. We have been existing for more than 30 years now. We are based here in Brussels, and uh, uh, one of our objectives is to give a voice to the victims and uh, oppressed people. Uh, we do that through conferences that we organize at the European Parliament when it is open, uh, and uh, also uh, through a daily newsletter about religious freedom uh, uh, around the world. But uh, we also have uh, a database of uh, people who are in the who are in prison uh, around the world because of their uh, religious or non-religious uh, beliefs, and we have documented uh, a few thousand uh, of such uh, cases uh, covering about uh, twenty countries, and Pakistan is one of them. Uh, in our database of uh, such prisoners. Uh, we have documented 47 cases of believers of all faiths in Pakistan who are in jail on the basis of uh, blasphemy laws. Uh, 26 Christians, 15 Sunni Muslims, 5 Ahmadis, 1 Shia Muslim. There are certainly more cases than those that are uh, accessible and visible uh, in uh, open uh, sources. But based on these statistics, um, 16 have been sentenced to death, although they are not executed uh, anymore, then they stay for life in the prison. So 16 sentenced to death, currently on the death row, but in, for life imprisonment in, uh, in reality. 16 others have been sentenced to life imprisonment. 10 have been in prison for many years and are still waiting for their trial. In one case, the uh, six-year prison sentence was imposed on the person. In four cases, we don't know what is the status of the, the prisoner. The case of Asia Bibi, of course, who was sentenced to death uh, in, uh, by hanging in 2010 and was finally acquitted for lack of evidence by the Supreme Court of Pakistan after spending many years on the death row is well known. When she was released, she had to go into hiding to avoid being killed by extremist groups or mobs, as it was already mentioned uh, before. That's the constant threat of uh, Christians that are accused uh, of uh, uh, committing or allegedly committing uh, blasphemy. She tried to apply for asylum in France and to other EU member states, but to no avail. She was finally welcome in Canada. And I would like to highlight another case that shows a number of similarities with uh, Asia Bibi and that concerns the EU uh, as well. As it was said uh, before, uh, on the 29th of April of this year, the European Parliament adopted a resolution on blasphemy laws in uh, Pakistan. And in the title, it was bless written blasphemy laws in Pakistan, in particular, the case of Shagufta Kauza, a caretaker in a Christian school, and her husband, Shafkat Emmanuel, who is partly paralyzed, and saying in his very first point, and I quote, where is Shagufta Kauzar and Shafkat Emmanuel, a Christian couple, were imprisoned in 2013 and sentenced to death in 2014 for blasphemy. Whereas they have been accused of sending blasphemous, so-called blasphemous text messages to a mosque cleric insulting the prophet Muhammad using a SIM card registered in Shagufta's name Whereas both the accused have consistently denied all allegations and believe that her national ID identity card was purposefully misused, the European Parliament strongly condemns the imprisonment and sentencing of Shagusta Kauzar and Shafkat Emmanuel, as well as the continued delay of their appeal hearing. The European Parliament 
calls on the Pakistani authorities to immediately and unconditionally release them. And I will not go on quoting uh, that, uh, <clears throat> that, uh, that text. But 681 members of the parliament voted in favor of the resolution. And I, I think it must also be stressed. Only three M MEPs opposed it. The Christian couple was finally released last month after eight years in prison, eight years in prison. They live in hiding as well as Asia Bibi for their security. They would now like to find a safe haven in an EU member state because there was such a resolution mentioning them by name. But they have not received any proposal from them, from any of the countries. And the applications for visa through various European embassies have mostly remained unanswered or have been turned out because they are in hiding for their safety, they have no job and no uh, proof of any income. The diplomatic missions have not proposed them an alternative process to, to get asylum in one way or another. Up to now, Germany was the only embassy to officially answer the Christian couple. But they said they could not be of any assistance. And I will quote their, their answer. This possibility is narrowly limited to exceptional cases. Well, if it's not, uh, uh, that are of particular exemplary political significance. So persons who have been active in human rights or opposition work in a particular outstanding and long-standing manner and are thus directly exposed to a massive threat to their physical integrity, which is their case here, and can sustainably avoid such a threat solely by being admitted to Germany. So not very encouraging answer, but it was the only one. The only way to ask uh, for political asylum then would be uh, to illegally cross a number of borders and arrive in any EU country where they could apply for asylum, but they do not un envisage such a dangerous uh, solution. So again, in this case, as in the Aja Bibi case, EU member states are failing to concretely help, not only in words, but in action, to concretely help persecuted Christians looking for a safe uh, haven and just turn a deaf ear to their requests. They are neither proactive nor uh, reactive. And this obstacle race of that Christian couple that started in 2013 in Pakistan is far from over if they want to live in a free country in a total security. Just a brief summary of what happened to them during all those years. So arrest, it was June 2013. Blasphemous messages or so-called blasphemous messages were sent to a cleric and a lawyer from a phone allegedly registered in Shagufta's uh, name. A month later, Shagufta and her husband were arrested and charged with blasphemy. 2014, nine months later, a court sentenced them to the death penalty, both of them. An appeal was filed in 2014, no? 2014. But it was indefinitely postponed on spurious reasons during almost uh, seven years. In May 2019, the, the, the lawyer of Aja Bibi uh, visited that uh, Christian couple and said, well, they, are, they both need medical care. Uh, Shafgat is disabled, as I said uh, before, is on bed, it can't move. And the latest doctor's report indicates that his whole back is almost destroyed from the bad sores and he may die in prison. But in February of this year, and this was not mentioned before me, three members of the European Parliament belonging to the Intergroup on Freedom of Religion or Belief filed a written parliamentary question addressed to Josep Borrell about blasphemy laws in general, but specifically about that uh, Christian 
couple. The answer of Borrell, I will just quote a small part, was the head of the EU delegation in Pakistan and the EU special representative on human rights have already raised the case of Shavgat Emmanuel and Shagufta Kauza with Pakistani authorities at the highest levels. I will later on come back to the rest of his answer, which is also interesting. April, it was already mentioned, 29th of April, there was a resolution of the European Parliament. So first written question, then resolution. And I think that it was uh, effective in a sense as uh, on the 3rd of June, that Pakistani Christian couple was finally released by, uh, by the Court of Appeal. So remember that the, the appeal was introduced in 2014 and postponed all the time during seven years. So after that period of time, finally, there was a hearing of the Court uh, of Appeal. And they said, well, lack of evidence, uh, sorry, but we, we have to acquit you and uh, you are free. But in the meantime, they had spent seven, eight years in, in prison. I will briefly come back to the, the blasphemy laws because there, were already some, uh, there was already some uh, discussion uh, about the contents and the history of the laws. Throughout the years, uh, and it started, as it was said, in, uh, already in 1860, uh, at the time of the British Empire, so when the British were ruling the whole region of, uh, of uh, South uh, Asia. And so there was a section already named the Section 295, uh, and it was endorsed by the then British Governor General. So the British have uh, a share and a part of their part of responsibility in uh, the, the existence of uh, the, the blasphemy laws. Then the same year, 200, uh, section 298, I will not quote the, the text, uh, uh, of course, but there was an inflation year after year, decade after decade. Uh, 295A and then B and then C uh, and then 298A and then B and then C and then quite recently uh, sections of the penal code targeting Ahmadis very specifically. Uh, and a lot of protests came from uh, the international human rights community, but also the EU, the United States, uh, and other countries uh, like, the, uh, like the UK. And I will come back on the advocacy or sometimes the failing advocacy of those, uh, of those countries. So <clears throat> inflation of uh, sections in the penal code about uh, blasphemy laws, and every time it's to restrict, of course, uh, the, the, the freedom of expression on religious issues and even not on religious issues, but they are said to be blasphemies against the prophet or against Islam, uh, against the Quran and so on uh, and so on. Historically, something that I think was not mentioned before me is that uh, in the 1927, a Hindu uh, publisher published an alleged provocative book on the life of Prophet uh, Muhammad, uh, written by a then unknown uh, author that outraged the Muslim community. And uh, that publisher was later assassinated for his so-called blasphemy by a Muslim uh, zealot. And his murderer was at that time hung and is still hailed as a martyr by uh, some uh, Muslim uh, communities. But as I said, uh, in the aftermath of this incident, we are now in the 20th uh, century and not anymore in the 19th century, the British rulers incorporated an additional section identified as section 295A. Uh, and that is, it was mentioned, uh, General uh, Zia Ulak uh, also added uh, another section, 295B. Then it was the turn of uh, Musharraf, uh, that was put in place with the support of the US and, and its allies. And so that's how, that's the reason why we have so many uh, articles now in, in the penal code. About the international advocacy. There was first a, a resolution by the European Parliament in June uh, 2017 and it was very clear. Uh, I will quote it. 
is so parliament is deeply concerned at the continued use of the blasphemy laws and believes this is heightening the climate of religious intolerance notes the findings of the supreme court of pakistan that individuals accused of blasphemy suffer beyond proportion or repair in the absence of adequate safeguards against misapplication or misuse of such laws calls therefore on the pakistani government to repeal section 295a uh, b c uh, uh, etc of the penal code to put in place effective procedural and institutional safeguards to prevent the misuse of blasphemy charges and also calls also on the, on the government of Pakistan to take a stronger position in condemning vigilantism towards alleged uh, blasphemers. So the situation was, was very clear in the minds of the European Parliament uh, at that time. The European Commission in 2018 uh, released a report for the European Parliament and the Council regarding the EU special incentive arrangement for sustainable development and good governance. So the GSP plus that uh, we have just talked uh, uh, about. And that was that report was covering this, the period 2016, 2017, but we will come back again on this issue, most probably at the time of uh, questions and answers. The United States uh, Commission on International Religious Freedom recommended in its latest report that the US State Department designate Pakistan as a country of particular concern, so CPC, for, and I quote, engaging in systematic, ongoing, and egregious violations of religious freedom, unquote. Despite being listed as a CPC, in 2019, the US Department of State waived Pakistan from any sanctions due to, and I quote, important national interests of the United States, unquote. So that's a problem because it means that uh, Pakistan is not under high pressure by the United States on the issue of blasphemy laws and religious freedom in general. But also the European Union uh, is a bit weak in its assessment of the GSP plus uh, mechanism. I said that there had been a, a parliamentary question in, on the 10th of February um, by uh, three uh, MEPs. And uh, the answer of Borrell was, I found, Ambig not ambiguous, but weak, weak in a sense. And I will quote it so that you, you realize what I mean by, by, by weak. So the high representative uh, vice president brought up the implementation of the 27 international conventions covered by the, general, by the GSP plus in the fifth EU Pakistan strategic dialogue with foreign minister Qureshi on the 3rd of November, 2020. This included explicit concerns regarding the death penalty and misuse of blasphemy legislation. Most recently, the EU reiterated its messages in this regard to Pakistan on the 2nd of March 2021 in the subgroup on trade of the EU-Pakistan Joint Commission. So up to now, it's OK. Just showing we did something in words. But he stressed alleged progress uh, of Pakistan in other areas. And I quote, the 2018-2019 report on the GSP plus shows that Pakistan is making progress over time in areas such as the elimination of honor killings, we'll see, the protection of transgender persons and the protection of women's and children's rights. However, a number of shortcomings still remain. The report includes reducing the scope of the death penalty as one of the priority areas for action. The EU will continue to closely monitor, address and encourage further progress on these issues. And the conclusion is a temporary withdrawal of GSP plus preferences would be a measure of last resort when all other actions fail. 
So that opens a huge space to say, well, let's keep it the GSP plus, let's not uh, uh, put too much pressure on, on Pakistan on, on those issues. And so I see that the, the United States are weak about this in that uh, the pressure that they could exert, but also the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you, Willy. Uh, I will bring also a third position, although the vast uh, majority of Muslim majority states have ratified the UN uh, Women's Convention, many have formulated so-called Sharia reservations, preserving the right to reject these parts of the conventions that contradict Islamic law in their opinion. We see in Pakistan that a lot of women are victim of these blasphemy laws. Similarly, many believe that the right to freedom of expression should be restricted in order to protect religious sentiments, whether through blasphemy laws or other legislation that is undermining the religion as a whole. Therefore, Islam and human rights are compatible only to the extent that human rights are not challenging Islamic law according to the human rights sectors. If the two are to be fully reconciled, some rights must be adjusted, re-evaluated, and if necessary, cancelled, because Islamic law is unchangeable and God-given in their perspective. I give the floor now to Manem Salmi, International Affairs Advisor of the members of European Parliament of the European People's Party at the European Parliament. You have the floor is yours, Manem Salmi. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I would like to congratulate LDL and uh, Gary for uh, the organization of this event and also thank uh, all the speakers, and particularly Jürgen and Paolo, for uh, their insights and also Mr. Willy for, for these uh, important insights. Uh, I will start. Is it working now? Okay. Uh, I would like to start with um, a small introduction um, concerning uh, the European Parliament's measures uh, and uh, the, uh, the European Commission as well, and later about the situation of women and minorities in, in Pakistan regarding blasphemy laws. So, uh, the European Parliament incorporated immediate reassessment of EU-Pakistan trade in April 2021. Uh, and uh, on April uh, 29th, uh, 2021, the European Parliament resolution on blasphemy laws was adapted. The resolution is critical not just for its forceful condemnation of the terrible state of the spiritual freedom in Pakistan, but also for its recognition that the European Union and the EU's trading, trading relationship with Pakistan is failing to uphold human rights. And its demands that the EU Commission immediately reconsider it is very, very urgent. On the 29th of April 2021, the European Parliament passed a resolution decrying the deterioration of what was already a terrible record of spiritual persecution in Pakistan. The resolution was passed 662 to 3, with 26 not voting. Significantly, the resolution also involved the Commission and also the European External Action Service. The right way um, review Pakistan's eligibility for GSP, which is the Generalized Scheme of Preferences plus status within the light of current events and whether there is a sufficient reason, reason to initiate a procedure for the temporary withdrawal of the status and therefore the benefits that included. And to report back to the European Commission and the European Parliament on this matter as soon as possible. End of quote. This provision was voted on separately and received even more votes in favor, passing with 678 votes in favor, eight against and 10 not voting. The motion refers to two specific cases, those of Shagufta Kaushar and Shafkat Emanuel. Uh, 
They are a Pakistani Christian couple convicted of blasphemy by a Pakistani court and sentenced to death by hanging back in 2013. They are speculated to have sent a blasphemous message against the Prophet, despite the couple being illiterate. And therefore, the message being in English, the couple failed to stand an opportunity of succeeding in their defense against the harmful blasphemy provisions and failed a system. In 2014, they appealed. However, the judiciary system of Lahore has since postponed the trial. Both suffer from medical conditions. Shafkat Emmanuel from damage to his neutral, uh, neural sorry, structure and Shagufta Kaushar from depression. They are not supplied with any adequate medical care. Understandably, their cases don't seem to be the only ones. The Center of Social Justice in Pakistan reports that a minimum of 1,855 people are charged under the blasphemy laws between 1987 and February 2021, with a major spike in 2020. Blasphemy laws seek to limit any speech that will be perceived as offensive to prophets. Despite a world movement to abolish offensive to abolish blasphemy laws, and many countries maintain these laws. In fact, a minimum of 13 countries sentence the corporal punishment for offenses committed in contravention for blasphemy laws. Blasphemy laws have always been problematic as they depend on the notion of causing if offense, which is subjective and vague. Blasphemy laws are supported by the notion of statements, outraging religious feelings and representations, insulting the faith or insulting the religious beliefs. Both outrage and insult are inexact concepts, which create legal uncertainty in nature. What's also um, what's also very important to highlight is that despite the very fact that blasphemy laws tend to use all to all or any religions, they are being used against religious minorities in states which, uh, in which we have laws, um, these laws existing. Public support for strict blasphemy laws in Pakistan is reportedly strong. However, it's clear that those that are calling for strict blasphemy laws are unlikely to ever should face the fees of blasphemy. These convicted people under blasphemy laws are minorities, especially Ahmadiyya and Christian minorities. The targeting of non-secular minorities confirms the various problems posed by blasphemy laws. They are not getting used to persecute genuine claims of blasphemy, but instead used to persecute religious minorities for daring to measure in accordance with their religious beliefs. Furthermore, anyone who tries to assist those charged with blasphemy are subjected to threats and violence. Shahabaz Bhatti, a Christian minister, was killed in an um, in ambush for attempting to reform the blasphemy law. The house of Shahbaz Gurbani, a lawyer defending a university lecturer accused of blasphemy, Junaid Hafiz, was raised by gunmen or on motorcycles, warning him to withdraw from the case. The lawyer of Asia Bibi, uh, Mr. Saif Al Maluk, had to escape the country in fear of his life. Such attacks also are common online, particularly on journalists, academics, civil society organizations, and political dissidents. The situation failed to change with Imran Khan, prime minister. On the contrary, reportedly, Imran Khan has been calling for the introduction of blasphemy laws in other countries. He reported to mention, I quote, together, we must always ask Europe, the European Union and World Organization to prevent hurting the sentiment of 1.25 billion Muslims, like they are doing not waste, case of Jews, 
would like the Muslim countries to plan a joint line of action over blasphemy issue with a warning of trade boycott of states where such incidents will happen. This can be the foremost effective thanks to achieve the goal, end of quote. So these, um, these laws have led to Muslim, Hindus, Christians, and other minorities to face prison sentences, including the capital punishment for statements associated with Islam. They need also to let to people accused of violation of those laws to be killed. But the problem is for Pakistan's religious and ethnic minorities is um, these laws because the European Parliament recognized religious mi minorities, including Hindus, Christians, and Sikhs, Ahmadiyya, and Shia Muslims, but they didn't recognize that they are dis discriminated against by society at large, and they are the targets of extremists. The practice of targeting religious minorities goes hand in hand with targeting ethnic groups particularly those like the Sindhi, who have large populations of Sikhs and Hindus, and who also reside, reside, reside sorry, in economic important regions. The Sindhs and Baluch, as an example, are regularly subjected to major human rights violations caused by economic development programs tied to Pakistan's Belt and Road Initiative Agreement with China, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Human rights are being abused in Pakistan and Afghanistan following the enforcement of blasphemy laws in those countries, where they function with a mechanism that automatically treats anyone professing a faith outside that of the bulk of Muslim population as a second class citizen, particularly female children, Christian, and Hindus are targeted and imprisoned without a trial and without access to a lawyer. Many of those people are subjected to sexual and physical abuse in prison. And a few have even died from injuries and suffered during such abuse. In one case, Pakistani authorities near Islamabad arrested a young Christian girl on charges of blasphemy after claims that she had burned pages of the Quran. While not much different from most other cases pursued under Pakistani infamous blasphemy laws, it attracts particular attention since Rim Shah Masih is just only 11 years and has learning disabilities related to backwardness. The blasphemy laws in Pakistan provide the legal basis for the persecution of many women and members of political minorities in Pakistan who are exclusively Christians and Hindus. The free speech guarantee within the Pakistani constitution doesn't protect the speech that's considered blasphemous. The proper to free speech is crowded out by protection for Islamic sensitivities. It's virtually, virtually extraordinary for the constitutional right to free speech to be raised as a defense in blasphemy cases. A reference, the article 14, page 374. Instead, defense attorneys tend to specialize in contesting the validity of the blasphemy accusations or arguing that the act didn't actually amount to blasphemy. The blasphemy laws in Pakistan still pose a heavy threat to human rights. The available evidence shows that increased religious regulation by government leads to more violence. So Pakistan's blasphemy laws, by virtue of evalu elevating Islam above other religions, make the, the believers of other religions susceptible to accusations of blasphemy in Pakistan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Manil. Uh, normally, we would also have uh, Cecil uh, Shane Chaudhry here from the, uh, he is the South Asia deputy team leader. 
Is he here online? Okay, thank you. Uh, we will give you now the floor. He is the representative of uh, Christian Solidarity Worldwide. Sicil uh, Shane Choudhury, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and uh, good morning to all. Uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot for having me at this conference. Um, uh, my dist the distinguished speakers have uh, spoken in length, at length and in, in much detail about the legality of the laws. Um, and so I would not repeat myself due to the shortage of time. Uh, but what I would like to really stress upon um, is, in, is the approach to deal with the blasphemy laws, the misuse of the blasphemy laws in Pakistan, and to understand how society in Pakistan is today viewing the laws. So the laws that, uh, that were amended in the 1980s era of General Ziaul Haq and, and awarded these severe punishments and penalties over this period of three to three, four decades, what we have seen is a, a narrative of biasness and hate um, that has been promoted through the education system, through other means. And today, society is bearing the brunt of that, that seed that was sown in the 1980s, where um, we've reached a stage where there is just no acceptance of the presence of religious or ethnic minorities uh, within the country. And so when we speak about dealing with the blasphemy laws, what is important is to look back and see how many years or decades this has taken for it to grow and then try to approach it in a way that we feel that is practical. Um, what I'm trying to basically imply is that uh, when we look at the education system, we see that the material, the content in the textbooks is historically distorted, it is biased, it is religiously biased, and it is hateful towards others, others meaning anyone other than the majority community. And that is constantly nurturing a society, new individuals, people who are now politicians or in the power circles, who subscribe to that narrative, who have uh, only been educated in that form. And therefore you see a total non-acceptance of the problem or in uh, an unwillingness to deal with the blasphemy laws. And uh, I mean, the, the mere fact that Asia Bibi's acquittal by the Supreme Court of Pakistan, which is the apex court of the country, despite that, you had TLP on the roads paralyzing the country, not accepting that, uh, that verdict. The, 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 the mere fact that the Supreme Court's judgment in 2014 for the protection and promotion of rights of religious minorities in 2014-19 June um, has still not been implemented, again, is reflective of the unwillingness of uh, the parliamentarians or the state machinery to address this issue. The fact that, as you mentioned, Mumtaz Qadri, the assassin of uh, Governor Salman Taseer, has been made into a saint and a shrine has been built over there is again reflective of the fact that a society is not looking at the laws of the land. They are not, they, if they have, it is these laws that were man-made uh, in the 1980s have assumed a divine acceptance. And therefore, society is not willing to allow any repeal for that matter. The mere fact that Shabazz Bhatti and Governor Salman Taseer were assassinated for demanding the repeal of these laws shows that there is no space to demand a repeal. And that is why I come back to this, the, the European uh, Parliament resolution, which is very good, very, very encouraging but we have not seen the actual change that we want. Yes, it is amazing that uh, Shagufta and Shafkat have been uh, acquitted, which is great, but the problem is not in just acquitting you know, these two people. There are so many others languishing and this law will continuously be misused by the people until and unless we don't address the laws and or the misuse of the law. And therefore I propose that it's better to rather than you know demanding the repeal of the laws is very good it's very strong but it's not practically possible no parliamentarian is going to risk his or her life in addressing that repealing of the law and have a noose around their own neck 
So the way to go about it is to demand, uh, as I always say, um, you know, like a homeopathic treatment. You have to go back to the root cause of the problem. So 40 years of biased ed education and curriculum needs to be addressed through the textbooks, through the teacher's training, through the reforms at the judicial level, through protections to judges and lawyers who are looking up at blasphemy cases and because of fear, pass on the buck to the next court, to the higher court because they fear for their own lives. And so there, we need to address procedural amendments step by step, try to address the problem. Otherwise, we won't get anywhere. We won't reach anywhere and these laws will remain and the misuse of the laws will continue. Another aspect which is very important is, is this, this radicalization and intolerance in society has uh, spilled over to the female community where cases of abductions, forced conversions and forced marriages are rampant. We have seen in the past year of 2020 during the pandemic and in this year, the amounts of cases of abductions and forced conversions that are taking place. And again, uh, you know, there is no criminaliz criminalization of forced conversions taking place because the, there is no lack of a political will. And uh, on, a, on a rather, you know, another note, no parliamentarian is willing to risk their lives or uh, damage their constituency because they know that the far right elements have a lot of street power and uh, can change by just accusing that parliamentarian of having committed blasphemy. And that's how delicate this issue has become and how increasingly important the blasphemy laws have, are becoming in Pakistan because as you know, back in the 90s or, or late uh, or mid 2000s, you would say it was, they were used for to personal, a, settle, uh, a personal score, to settle a personal score. But today, it's no longer that. If I don't like you because of your faith, I, I can easily accuse you of blasphemy. So there's no personal setting uh, score set anymore. It's just a non-acceptance. I'm a, a Christian from Pakistan. I recently moved to the UK and I was heading the a Catholic Commission for Justice and Peace in Pakistan for the past seven years. In my experience, in my dealing with the education sector, and people from the education sector, they often would say, oh, yes, we respect the Christians. After all, you are guests in our country. That itself is so alarming an answer to get for a person, for me, who was born and brought up in that country, who spent more than 45 years of my life. My father fought two wars for that country. And uh, yet I'm being considered to be a guest in, in Pakistan. So I think it is very important for us to take practical, pragmatic steps to address the issue, um, and we must uh, must lay emphasis on the education because UK, for example, is one of the biggest donors of developmental aid to Pakistan. And I think the EU needs to also stress on this that, yes, you are making schools, you are bringing more out of school children in, into the schools, but what is the quality of the education that you are uh, teaching to these children because you are we in in doing so we are developing more and more of an extremist mindset that will have no regard and no respect and no recognition of the presence of religious and sectarian minority communities within the country so uh, i won't take much time but i think i would stop there and uh, i'd be happy to contribute later on but thanks a lot for for having me thank you uh, thank you. Cecil. Shane Chaudhry, uh, for your comment. Uh, uh, I still want to uh, share a fourth position uh, within the Islam ideologies. Uh, there is nothing uh, in Islamic law that prevents human rights. There is little in Islamic law that forbids civil rights. And it's due to misunderstandings and misinterpretations of the statute that there is one. This is what the British imam said about Islamic blasphemy laws and human rights at the lecture. He, together with several others, opposes the extreme conservatism of the critics to human rights, claiming that Islamic rule should be re-evaluated in terms that are more human rights compliant. While in Muslim communities today, the strict interpretation of Islamic law by 
Islamists appear to dominate in Pakistan, traditionally we can find several traces of much more open, realistic interpretations of Pakistanis abroad. Just over a century earlier, Islamic modernists proposed a revision of traditional Islamic jurisprudence, trying to incorporate modern Western ideals and concepts rather than, as many present Islamists do, firmly opposing them. Muhammad Abdu, a leading figure in Islamic modernism, said that Muslims must use justifications to keep up, to keep up with the changing times, rather than rely on the ancient Middle Ages clerics interpretations. An example of this pragmatic position is the Indonesian organization Nadlatul Ulama, one of the largest Muslim organizations in the world. Nadlatul Ulama seeks to promote certain rights of women by means of religious fatwas. Acting pragmatically with the existing legal structure, they and other supporters of this stance aim to expand the limits on how to understand Islamic law, fostering space for human rights, but without fundamentally questioning Islamic law, religious authority. Islamic law is, to put it in another way, the only authority for them under which civil rights can be subsumed. The Quran is not a constitution. Pragmatic changes of Islamic law are not enough for a small but potentially increasing community of Muslims if Islamic blasphemy laws and human rights are to be reconciled, the claim that disputes between the two are not about misinterpretations of Islamic law, but about the basic meaning of Islamic law. The Quran is not a law or even a constitution, argues the Tunisian scholar Muhammad Talbi. Similarly, the Egyptian legal scholar Muhammad said Said al-Ashmawi argued that Sharia should be looked as a collective of a collection of ethical and social norms rather than legal laws. Rather than seeking to reconcile traditional Islamic jurisprudence, these modern Muslim theorists dismiss such jurisprudence as being important. For example, Musawa's International Muslim Women's Movement engages in critical historical studies of Quran and Islamic jurisprudence, showing how interpretations are determined by their context and shaped by humans rather than good given, God given and definitive. All Musawa representatives says we are trying to develop a new feminist knowledge in Islam that is based on human rights principles, constitutional guarantees, and the lives of women today. Are Islamic blasphemy laws and human rights compatible? This brief overview shows that a simple yes or no cannot answer the question of compatibility between the Islam and human rights. One must instead ask what kinds of Islam are compatible with what kinds of human rights, when, where, and with whom. These various positions outlined here illustrate that Islam involves a multitude of different voices, interpretations, and human rights positions promoted by various actors in different historical, social, cultural, and political context. If we want to promote human rights, it's important to have all these Muslim voices participating in the discourse on human rights. The sceptics, the pragmatics, and the leftists. The pragmatists who reject the old Islam ideologies may have more luck here. They also gain more mainstream sympathy and may create bridges with more conservative human rights sceptics and help to fight this old fashioned blasphemy laws in Pakistan. 
It's important to remember the skepticism that emerges from these skeptics and critics of human rights, not to give in to it, but to consider when and where it emerges from. Criticism can be strategically and ideologically oriented. And it's sometimes so, but does and does often represent a clear isolation and detachment from the framework of human rights arising from moral differences and direct perceptions of inefficiency, double standards, and even lip service in the framework. It's time now for questions and answers. Uh, do you have some questions and answers from who? Uh, can somebody? Uh, yes, it's all right. Right. It's all right. No problem. I'll speak loudly. Yes, but it will not be easy to hear. We will need a, a mic. Okay. You can come here to ask your question. Yes, okay. okay. Thank you. Otherwise, the audience will not. Uh, we have a lot of online audience. Okay. That's okay. Is it works? Yes. Can you hear well? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for providing this opportunity to attend this seminar on very important subject like uh, blasphemy laws in Pakistan. Um, I am very much agreed with the uh, speakers. Whatever is said, that is just uh, one aspect of the picture that is specifically spoken about the non-Muslims. It is very clear that uh, at the time of partition of British uh, India, uh, there were uh, more numbers of uh, non-Muslims, minorities, uh, that uh, gradually declined. And today, they, they left only one and a half percent of the total population. So the real problem is that the state is using these laws to press not only the minorities of the country, but also to press the dissenting voices, the human rights def defenders, journalists, dissenting voices, civil society activists, and secular democratic progressive human rights defenders in the country. Like uh, Salman Tasir, who was the sitting governor, he was not a, a, a Christian or Hindu or Sikh or Jew, he was a Muslim. And just because of speaking in defense of human rights, he was assassinated. Unlike many others, and I am one of uh, the examples standing just before you, I am a human rights defender. I hail from Pakistani occupied Kashmir. And from 2005, uh, I have been lobbying in the European Parliament for the repealing of all these 295 ABC and other discriminatory laws, which are also in practice in over part of Kashmir. And from 2010, I'm continuously contributing at United Nations Human Rights Council. Just because of lobbying and speaking in defense of human rights, universal human rights, not only for any particular community, but for all, for everyone, I was blacklisted in 2017, calling me that this person is lobbying in the European Parliament and speaking at the United Nations Human Rights Council in favor of human rights. So this is the situation. And when the Human Rights Minister of Pakistan came to visit uh, two years before, before the pandemic, uh, she said, oh, we are trying to improve the situation and we are doing this, we are doing that. But just day before yesterday, elections held in Pakistani occupied Kashmir and TLP, which claims the beheading of French ambassador at Islamabad and expulsion of French ambassador at Islamabad is contesting elections. In Pakistan, it is banned faction, but in Pakistani occupied Kashmir, they are contesting elections. They are given full space to contest elections, to recruit the young people, to, to create more hatred and radicalization. Just last month, one of a person, he was a Canadian national from Kotli, District Kotli in Pakistani occupied Kashmir, which is commonly referred as Azad Kashmir. Maybe you would have now have uh, heard about this uh, area. He went back to, to attend the funeral of his father. He was so liberal that he has been attending uh, religious uh, festivals of Hindus, Christians, Sikhs in Toronto, in Calgary in all parts of Canada, and he was just condemned to death. And he was shot dead at his uh, bedroom. And the state said the killers were unknown. 
and then they start then they start a propaganda that uh, uh, he was uh, out of the islam he left islam he become uh, a murtad the person who, who yes so he has to be killed and now uh, they arrested his wife for plotting that conspiracy and then the case is shut down so this is the real situation which need to be addressed with regard to the gsp plus because pakistan has got special status and gsp plus is conditional with the improvement of human rights thank you very much okay okay this was a comment um but uh, is there somebody willing to respond on this comment uh willy or uh, manel you can start okay, okay yeah thank manuel you. will start okay thank you. thank you very much for your testimony i was reading um, can you, can you this? thank you very much for this testimony i i was really um, moved by this testimony because you you mentioned a, a true story but also a lot of people human rights activists not only uh, non-muslim activists but also muslim activists who are for peace and for coexistence in pakistan and um uh, it's it's really important to uh, uh, to work on education i think as um uh, the member of parliament mentioned it is very important to uh, to um uh, fight against hatred and radicalization because this is a long-term process we have the same ex i mean we have the same problem here in europe we have the same problem in so many muslim countries we have no exception uh, so uh, this discourse uh, of hatred of um, uh, division i think in, in within the same society considering that christian or hindus or or other minorities are do not belong to the uh, to this society is really dangerous because they are born and raised in Pakistan or born and raised in any country and this is their country uh, so I, I, I believe that uh, secularism is the key but it's very difficult to implement it in so many uh, in so many countries so we go step by step and and europe can use um uh, let's say this uh, opportunity of putting pressure by economic sanctions so the gsp is very important um i think that you have to continue lobbying other people have to continue i know it's very dangerous for you and for other people. But uh, I believe that so many uh, human rights activists, so many uh, journalists, academics, free um, um, uh, liberal, um, let's say activists are uh, really working uh, towards a better society and towards um, um, uh, cohesion and towards um, coexistence. Uh, it's a long term, but it starts with education, but it also it starts with the support of the international community, uh, like the European Commission, like the European Union, like the United Nations. And it's very important to highlight that economic sanctions do work they do work and uh, it's very important to uh, uh, that europe and the us work together also to put economic pressure on on pakistan uh, this is it's not only the case of pakistan the case of so many other countries like iran uh, i i know the the minorities in iran i'm in contact with them and, and i know how they suffer uh, because of uh, of um, let's say um, uh, they are considered as second class citizens because they are minorities uh, so it's the same with with Hindus and and Sikhs and and Christians in Pakistan. So I, I believe that Europe and and the United States, as free countries and as democracies, should um, and and, and uh, sh can do a lot for these countries. So we have to to uh, to work together with uh, NGOs, with politicians, with academics, with lobbyists in order to put much pressure. And uh, I, I believe that uh, G GPS and economic sanctions do work. Thank you. Really? Yeah, uh, really? Sh a short comment as well. You are right to stress that uh, uh, Muslims are also victims of uh, those blasphemy laws and in particular uh, human rights defenders uh, in Pakistan who oppose uh, such laws and uh, especially the abuse and misuse of uh, uh, those laws. But I, I'm, I'm also aware that here in Europe or at least uh, outside Pakistan, not to use the word the West, 
uh, that our situation is a bit difficult to make some progress, to, to exert some pressure that would lead to some progress because uh, any change uh, in, well, related to, to those laws in one way or another should not be perceived, should not appear as a move pushed by the West. Uh, because it would automatically fail and that would fuel the propaganda of the extremist groups. But one, I think I see two, two directions in which uh, we, we could work from, from our countries. First, of course, to support the human rights defenders opposing the laws, such laws and uh, uh, the abuse of such laws. But also a second point that has not been raised during the, the discussion that is hardly raised, in fact, is that uh, accusations are uh, made by individuals and uh, quite often they are unfounded, but they are not those people who accuse a Christian or a, or a Hindu, etc., of uh, uh, blasphemy. Uh, they are never prosecuted uh, for such false accusations. And, and, and I think that it would be good to, to point at that uh, situation that the judiciary uh, should prosecute such people. I, I'm sure that there are such provisions in the, in the laws uh, in, uh, in Pakistan as in any other country. Uh, and so I think that's an, another venue, uh, avenue uh, that could be uh, one of our targets in our, in our uh, advocacy to identify and to make sure that those false accusers are really prosecuted and sentenced in one way or another, heavy fine or, or something else. Yeah, that's all for the moment. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question from, uh, maybe we have a question from Shahid Nashir Ahmed. He is uh, one of the responsible of the French Mus Muslim uh, community. Uh, Shahid Nashir uh, Ahmed, uh, the floor yes. is yours. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Uh, for the organization of this uh, program and uh, with Willy Fautre, Les Autres. Uh, please, I want to just uh, say a few words that uh, what you are talking is very useful. And uh, one point is that whenever the Pakistani officials, they are in Pakistan, they sing on the music of the local mullah-minded people. But when they come outside of Pakistan and uh, the, uh, the press or media ask them questions. Recently, when the Mr. Qureshi, foreign minister was in Germany, one journalist asked that what is happening with Ahmadi in Pakistan? They are not letting uh, bury their dead bodies or they are demolishing the minaret of their mosque. And he categorically refused. He said, it is not happening. You see, I think, uh, this should be also dealt with, that why they have two uh, different uh, contradictory opinions inside Pakistan and outside Pakistan. They refuse, it is not happening. While the world is knowing it is happening. The second point is, uh, I think the world should also tackle this issue from the Islamic, uh, Quranic uh, point of view. Because according to the Quran, there is no punishment for blasphemy. Blasphemy was committed against the Prophet of Islam, against the Quran, during the life of the Prophet. And no punishment was given. It is anti-Islamic law. You see, I think sometime uh, the secular people outside of Pakistan should tell these Pakistani uh, delegates or governments that why you are mocking and doing blasphemy against your own religion. When punishment is not in Quran, why you are doing it in the name of Islam? just to please this mullah-minded people who create disorder in the world. This, uh, just I wanted to say. Um, to one of the people of the um, uh, Manel or Willy Fautre, you want to have a comment from them? You want to comment, uh, Manel? Uh, yes, uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Shahid for his comment. 
uh, I, I believe that it's very important to mention uh, that, uh, as he said, that in Islam there is no law that um, mentions that you have to, uh, uh, I mean, to kill someone who is not, um, yes, uh, who is not believer. So uh, uh, he, he said uh, that uh, the mullah uh, implemented this kind of law, uh, so which is very extremist um, version of the religion. Um, it's clear that uh, a lot. Uh, I'm not a. Th I mean, I'm not a, an expert in in Islam, but um, I, I'm of. I'm Muslim myself, but I, I know a lot about Quran, and about uh, the religion. So I think that uh, we need uh, what really lacks is Muslim scholars condemning these blasphemy laws and uh, Muslim scholars and and researchers. Um, uh, who will be able, um, I mean, to stop these kinds of, of prejudices against um, Islam. But unfortunately, as a lot, a lot of the speakers said, um, um, like MEPs, like uh, uh, so many um, uh, activists, it's very difficult to tackle this issue because they are afraid of, of having, ter I mean, um, uh, threats, um, death threats. And I know a lot of uh, one of my friend, uh, uh, the French Imam, um, Imam Shalgoumi, uh, uh, who is uh, very commend, I mean, uh, who is very engaged. Um, he received a lot of death threats because he went to uh, the, ma the demonstration against Charlie Hebdo when people um, uh, I mean, uh, demonstrated to support the freedom of speech, and he was one of the imams uh, who participated, so he, he got a lot of death threats. So unfortunately, people who, I mean, uh, Muslim scholars who are for, um, uh, for uh, supporting um, uh, a, um, a uh, liberal Islam, a true version, um, and a, um, a, a, a European version of Islam uh, are threatened and also persecuted. So um, I would like to highlight that and, and I would like to thank uh, uh, Mr. Shahid for this comment. Uh, and Willy, uh, you have a comment? Not, not really on what he said, because I, I agree with you uh, uh, as well that uh, Muslim scholars, researchers, human rights defenders in, in Pakistan uh, should be assisted by us in the best way, uh, in the most effective way, uh, so that they promote uh, another uh, vision of Islam, more tolerant uh, among some extremist groups. Uh, that's oh, of course, it's a long-term uh, strategy. Huh? It will absolutely uh, take time, but it must also be uh, undertaken. No, I, I just want to, to conclude on my side and uh, focusing again on the EU, that and especially the GSP plus, that, uh, well, business should not be first and values second, but the opposite. Values first and business second. Thank you. Are there still uh, questions from the audience? No, so uh, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank Paul Kasaka. I want to thank Cecil. Uh, um, uh, I want to thank uh, Shahid Nashir Ahmed. I want to thank um, Jürgen uh, Klute and uh, Willy Fautre, Manem Salmi, Gary Cartwright, uh, and everybody who attended this meeting. Thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs>